When I was growing up, the best films were also the most successful films. I mean, I've been very public about the fact that Jaws is one of my favorite movies of all time. And Ocean's Eleven was my opportunity to try and make a movie like that. Just a pure piece of entertainment. But there's a lot of sweat involved in making something breezy. And that was kind of unexpected. So how did the idea for Ocean's Eleven first pop up in everyone's head? Well, it didn't pop up in everybody's head. It popped up in my head. I was around for the first Ocean's Eleven in 1960 at the Sands Hotel. I was working with Sinatra. I was in the music business then. And I always had it in my mind that someday I'd be able to remake this picture. I liked the idea of it because I think that film had a a strong premise, but could certainly be updated and retooled. The guys were the coolest, Frank and Sammy and Dean. Nobody touches them. <laughs> but the Rat Pack thing had sort of been played out by 1999. We had had swingers doing retro, nouveau Rat Pack, and that kind of martini craze had already peaked. So the ambition was to make a guy's guy movie. Sting, Butch Cassidy, and the Sundance Kid, that kind of a feeling between a whole bunch of stars. Well, it started with George, obviously, because I thought he was the guy to play Danny. George is Danny Ocean. He's got the devil in his eye, but he's all business. We sent a script to Julia, and she signed on, and we met with Brad that week. We said, who's directing? Steven. Okay, I'm in. By the end of the week, it was already a go picture. And then we started piecing the cast together. It was a crucial piece of casting because there's supposed to be a camaraderie that is really difficult to fake. You don't really have that much time setting up these guys. We wanted all 11 to be very specific and memorable. And so we were pretty careful all the way down the line about who was going to play these characters. That's why we had to be very precise. Mm. Well funded. Yeah. You gotta be nuts, too. And you're gonna need a crew as nuts as you are. Who do you got in mind? I remember the phone call I got from, you know, my agent. You think he'd do it? If he does it, that'd be so great. You know, it says twin brothers. And they says Casey Affleck, who, you know, I'm way prettier than he is. You know, I'm thinking about Elliot. Bernie Mac. He's a man possessed. I have a script in my car called Ocean's Eleven. You're in it. And I said, I'm in it. Carl Reiner is an old friend of mine. Shabo, he's his own circus. He was a kid plucked from China. Are you in out? I don't want the movie to come out and not be a part. And I tell him, brother, I'm in. So we have this ensemble, this great crew. It's a good plan. No, sir. I wouldn't even think about leaving the state. You have to decide early on, you know, what kind of film are we making? Ocean's Eleven. It's a throwback kind of film, a film from maybe the 40s with the kind of 70s aesthetic thrown in. It's a very non-threatening film. What, did you guys get a group rate or something? And that's what I wanted, because I'd come off two fairly heavy dramas. We'd worked on these other movies, like a little darker or, you know, a, more of a kind of a character study like Aaron Brockovich. But now we're making a popcorn movie. Some of the first stuff we shot was when George goes to recruit Matt in Chicago. And I think between Stephen and George, they were able to kind of say, hey, we're here to have fun. That's the best lift I've seen you make yet. It was kind of dead of winter with a howling wind coming in off the lake. But the vibe was dynamic and it was kind of working. Steven, one day he came in and said, let's just have fun with it editorially as well. You know that wife they do in the Brady Bunch? Can we do some of that? And putting the team together, it gave us a chance to really play with the rhythm and just the style of it. 
to me, it was really a sense of how much fun this movie was going to be. Hang on to your niggas. <laughs> they weren't expecting that shit. <laughs> The first scene at Ruben's house where Danny sort of lays out the plan was one of the first scenes we have with all the guys. Gentlemen, welcome to Las Vegas. Parker. So it was a real challenge for Steven, I think, to figure out how to cover all the guys properly and keep the scene interesting. OK, guys, this will be a picture. Picture! It's like this high octane room. Everyone had their quiet moments. I know I did of kind of leaning against the wall and looking around and going, man, that's Carl Reiner, you know. There's Brad Pitt, Don Cheadle, and Bernie Mac. The first five minutes was like, wow, let's see what happens. Steven blocked the scene with the cast, and it was interesting how the guys all sort of fell into these chairs around him. And he sort of picked all the angles, and this is how I'm going to shoot George. The unusual thing about being on a set of Stevens is that he's also operating the camera. OK, lock it up. Here we go. There are much better cinematographers out there than me. But operating the camera puts you right there. You don't miss anything the actor's doing. And most of it's just momentum. I just like the momentum of it. Steven was walking around us and figuring out how to capture what it is he wants to capture. After his question and Brad's response, that reaction, he did just do it like sooner after that. Just check him, check him. His directions are very simple, very to the point. He seems really confident and relaxed. Everyone else then suddenly is kind of relaxed and having fun. No, not me, whoa. <laughs> and to see all the guys together, everyone's got their own color and their character going on. It was just great to see Stephen and this fantastic kind of multi-generational cast. On a lot of movies, this scene, which is four pages long, could take two days to shoot. Good. And I think we had knocked it off in six hours. That's what I said. So you take all that, you take Steven Soderbergh, all those stars, then you go and you have the backdrop of Vegas. Vegas is a character in the movie, and I wanted it to be kind of, you know, sparkling. With Steven, it was always about showing the idealized Vegas, you know, the, the Vegas of Sinatra and Dean Martin. Everybody still wore suits and ties and long gowns and kind of gave it a bit of a more of a ballroom sense. But one of the things that scared me in reading the script was the amount of time that we would have to be shooting on the streets of Vegas and on the floor of the casinos. And, you know, Las Vegas, it's the one town that's tough to double. So Jerry went in early to the Bellagio, and he knows everyone in key positions there. Now, that first one we asked him, they said, oh, we can't do it, we can't do it. Our eyes were bigger than our stomachs. That's exactly what it is, pure ego. But he was hunting with an elephant gun, Julia Roberts, George Clooney, Brad Pitt. I mean, he had a good deal of ammo going in. <laughs> and they said, OK, we'll take a shot with you, even though we were going to rob it. <laughs> and you got an $850 million set. And so we turned off the fountains. We closed down the atrium. We closed down the entranceway. We closed valet parking for three days. People had to check in through the garage. That's a stretch, you know, for, for a Vegas hotel. Steven made sure to capture all that because I don't think anyone will ever get what we got again. Yeah, thanks to Jerry. Hit the star. And action. The main thing being that they let us shoot during the day, which they normally don't do and they would close down an entire section of the floor so that we could film in there. We got the casino from 6 a.m. till 4 in the afternoon. It was really like, just bring up the light level on the floor, set up the shots, and let's go. Excuse me, Mr. Benedict. Yes. Hi, Sheldon Willis, Nevada Gaming Commission. I need two minutes of your time. 
It was like a, an actor's dream to be able to play as the character in the real environment. We were shooting in pit number five, which is sort of the, the high-end pit. I'd look around and the casino was functioning. Watching Andy Garcia move through the casino, you bought and believed that he owned that joint. The Bellagio was his baby. It was a part of him and he was a part of it. We were all moving really quickly and everybody had their blinders on. You'd have these shots on the casino floor and it'd be George and Brad and Julian just off camera would be hundreds of people watching, thankfully really respectful and quiet during the take. And as soon as we'd cut, you know, there'd sort of be the roar of approval. It was fantastic, but one of the things we found out on our initial schedule was they don't even have a vault. It's kind of like Pee Wee Herman asking about the basement of the Alamo, you know, so it allowed me a, a lot of freedom just to sort of get a little kind of James Bond with it. We had an elevator shaft that supposedly went down hundreds of feet, and stainless steel, just slick, slick, slick. We lit from the floor, sort of looked a little, you know, it's like Kubrick would have done, and then heightened that a bit, so it's cool but the rest of it was really predicated on you know, the Bellagio. And then letting Vegas be Vegas and the boys be the boys. It was fun. When we went to Las Vegas to start shooting, we made a conscious effort to get these guys to hang out together. <laughs> it wasn't hard to do because they all like each other, but to really hang out. Tomorrow day is yours, do with it what you like. So off camera, basketball games, backgammon, jokes, and other R-rated activities. You call up and you say, hey, who wants to have breakfast? I would always start with Brad, and then he would say no, and I'd end up with Casey or something. But what happened is a real camaraderie built up. And it was very hard to go to work, because while they're setting up, the cast member is now chatting with each other. Oh, yeah. And of course, George Clooney. He may be the best-looking silly person in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes it would have to be action. Oh, guys, action. Steven, as professional as all these guys are, I get the impression that when you called action, it was like herding cats. <laughs> <laughs> but a testament to, I think, how well we cast the film was, between takes, they would never go to their trailer. They would all stay right on the set, sort of talking and screwing around. <laughs> Things come out of genuine camaraderie that you can't plan. In this case, funny things. Where are you gonna put your hands? No good. But comedies are hard, you know. You have to be careful that they don't become smug. For God's sake, whatever you do, don't under any circumstance. Russ. Yeah. Can you take a look at this? Sure. Hey, Russ. Steven said to me when I met him, if just having fun while you make a movie were the only criteria, then Cannonball Run would be the greatest movie ever made. <laughs> if we were ever caught winking at the camera, then the whole thing is kind of blown. So I think it was on everybody's mind to make sure we were telling a story and not just having a lark. And also George Clooney and Brad leading the pack and saying this is the tone we're setting. I've been practicing this speech a little bit. Did I rush it? It felt like I rushed it. No, it was good. I liked it. And what I liked about it is that it wasn't gag humor. I want to knock over a casino. I mean, sometimes the way in which two characters look at each other <laughs> is as funny as any line or pratfall you can come up with. I see you 500. Where's your 2,000? The card game scene. If you look at what those guys are doing back and forth, they're saying so much with just a slight twitch of the eyebrow. It just was really cool. All right, kids. Name of the game is poker. Steven said, do you want to come play yourself in this movie? And I didn't understand what he meant. And when I saw the script, I thought, oh, I get it. It's like the worst possible human version of yourself. What the hell? It's pocket change, right? <laughs> <laughs> and we'd had a loose vibe on traffic, and I kind of knew he'd probably be open to that. All right, here we go, guys. Stand by. Because the camera just kind of kept rotating the table, we were able to add whatever we wanted. You know, Topher is my sister's name. 
Is it hard moving from television to, to film? Not for me. Yeah. In Ocean's Eleven, Steven Soderbergh is able to capture those kind of live moments between the actors. <laughs> Great. He talks about figuring out a way to create a kind of controlled anarchy. And action. Create an environment where anything can happen, but also have some kind of element of control. Take a few beats after action. Let him get a little, uh, some sparks going. He definitely knows what he wants. But within that, there's flexibility. He's very open to whoever's got the best idea in the room, you know, to give us the idea. No, no, that was great. So it was always kind of interactive and collaborative. And then the guys would bring their own, like, little embellishment. Like, every time you see Brad, he's eating junk food. I think the eating thing came out of a meeting with Brad and Steven. I think I think Brad just said, I'd, let, I'd love to be eating. And so it was like the third time Brad was eating on set, everybody realized, oh, I guess that's Brad's thing. Shrimp, and there were kind of riffs that these guys were doing, you know, we were all cracking up and laughing. Hey, do you think that this beard makes me look fat? Seriously. Do you like Duran Duran? Casey and I, I think we did one exactly on how it was on the paper, and then Steven said, go play and have fun with it. You are so stupid. You know that? You're a nip. You think it helps to call someone hey, hands? Sorry, hey, you feeling really upset? And then yeah, I think he had to tell us to stop at some point, like shut up, because we just kept going and going. I think I lost my key card. I think I lost it. He'll say something, and I'll say something back, and pretty soon we're like wrestling on the floor. You're like a little girl. Relax. Let's do this good? all day. Don't I'm going to get out of the car, and I'm going to drop you like third period French, OK? I know Matt had a good line when he talks about uh, a record longer than his arm. And then Don Cheadle, he had all the sort of the cockneyisms. Oh, would you look at his donut? It's difficult because there's a lot of different tricky vowel things that go on. And it wasn't squishy like like it usually is. It was hard like a like a Brazil nut. And then I started studying it and got together with the dialect guy and really drilled it. So unless we intend to do this job in Reno, we're in Barney. Barney Rubble. Trouble! And of course, Bernie's very funny. Thank you. Everyone was trying to keep up with Bernie and, and his jokes. Mr. Benedict, I'm afraid you've been employing an ex-convict. He's in hell, he's just a goddamn cracker. Frank has some great lines. You heard what I said. I like to just do it and let it come out from inside and let it go. No, 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 why didn't okay, I... it's all right, come on, sit down. Sit down. Sorry. Sorry for you. <laughs> he wasn't doing uh, a stand-up routine. He was just this incredibly talented actor. Right. Yeah, good. Exactly. Who looks you straight in the eyes and makes you, you know, howl. You're 30 seconds late. I was about to send out the search. At the same time, it's not a sitcom. Oh, it is. This is a movie in which people have grown up conversations with each other. And to have Julia do this, part of the fun was that it was 180 degrees from Aaron Brockovich. Well, I was actually a little bit intimidated because it's kind of like a glamorous part, which I'm not really used to being so dressed up all the time. But she's more than just a girl. She's got some intrigue behind her and some difficult crosses to bear. You're not wearing your ring. I sold it. I don't have a husband, or didn't you get the papers? My last day inside. I told you I'd write. Doing scenes with Julia, it's like an old Howard Hawks film. They're both kind of going at each other pretty good. His work definitely fell off as he got older. Remind you of anyone? And nobody really wins, which is the way it should be. It's so sharp and exacting, and you can see all the multitude of levels and emotions that goes on between the two of them. Test, test. What? <laughs> Except it's really hard acting with George. <laughs> because, you know, I'm supposed to be steely and serious. And he's just like this hideous, you know, charm monster. Just do this. <laughs> <laughs> George could make Julia laugh. And when Julia laughs, she can be quite loud. <laughs> it's a true laugh. It's not a fake laugh. I was really pleased with the way all that stuff landed. Excellent. And the cast, 
I felt like everybody brought their A game, but it also puts more pressure on me because that means I got to bring my A game. Steven, tilt up, make sure those guys aren't in a bad spot. Yeah, they're good. Bennett? Okay, here we go. Let's do it. Ocean's 11. Three quarters of the film is us actually pulling this heist off. These things are gonna hold us, right? It's like a jaw-dropping undertaking. And it's just the most complicated heist in the history of heists. Say we get into the cage and, and through the security doors there and down the elevator and past the guards with the guns and into the vault. We're just supposed to walk out of there with $150 million in cash on us without getting stopped? Yeah. One of the tricks of, of making a movie like this is how much information to give and at what time. You're out, Danny. He's out? This is a smoke and mirrors movie. Everything has to be finessed to just the right level of subtlety. Before we shot, I figured Living Sindel would be the only character that should know on paper what exactly happens. So I had this notebook with tons of notes. Each letter had a through line of what someone had to do. And to keep these through lines in my own head with months to prepare, it was almost impossible. Livingston, we're set. Livingston, we're set. Basher, we're set. Hang on a minute, Chief. And for me, it's a completely different way of shooting than what I'd been doing the last few years. It's a very constructed, composed, and theatrical kind of film. So there were a lot of times where, as cinematographer, I was waiting for the director to figure out what he wanted to do. Several instances in which we would set up shots for two hours, and before even shooting them, I'd say, tear it down. It's not working. It's not good enough. Halfway through this, I just thought, what did I get into? But I've known Steven since my school days and in his young directing days. And he's just so damn committed to what he's doing. When he won the Oscar, the next day he had scheduled for himself a 6 a.m. shooting call. Hey, great. One more like Okay, that. we got it. You know, six hours later, he's back at work. He's totally focused, totally prepared, and he cuts it in his mind. He's editing as he's shooting. So he goes first. He goes first. He goes first, and then I'll swing over to you. All right, let's shoot. Yep. You could just see it click in his mind how he was going to shoot it. OK, this is what we're doing. We're here, we're here, and we're here. And then off we went. Here we go. And roll sound. OK, let's go. Here we go. And so the heist itself. Steven had it all worked out in terms of, you know, just shooting all these tiny little pieces of things that once they were all fit together just made perfect, incredible sense. Every frame of that movie is there for a reason. You know, someone buys balloons and you don't understand why, and the next minute the balloons are released covering a security camera for just a second so that a guard has to come off of a door to take the balloons down, and when he's off the door, someone can sneak in. The cons just worked, and you just cared about the outcome and, and what happened with these characters. And, you know, Soderbergh, he really brings out a full dimensional life for some character who shows up for five minutes. Bruiser, not until later. Sorry, Danny, I forgot. Every part is just as important as the leads. I mean, the Chinese acrobat is one of, like, the key pieces of the film. God, I think I lost my car. Are you serious? Oh, the banter Jesus. between the two brothers is just as funny and witty as the banter between Clooney and Pitt. Walsh, cue up the tape to the robbery. And you realize why they needed Eleven and why everybody was integral to it working. I don't understand. What happened to all that money? So it was a challenge to pull this off. It was really well laid out, and the actors really hit it. And that lifts everything up. You of all people should know, Terry. In your hotel, there's always someone watching. There's a scene with all of them in front of the fountain. And it ends up being more affecting than you might imagine especially in the midst of such a breezy piece of entertainment. I remember how we did it. 
you know, everybody basically took their places and Stephen would make the adjustments as to how he wanted it to be. Stephen never likes to tell people where to stand. So he's just like, go stand. But I was next to Brad, so I'd give a position. And I was like, all right, that's what work. And action, guys. But then as Stephen was shooting it, the idea of let's have Saul be the last one sort of evolved in the moment. Well, all of a sudden, I became the middle, and everybody peeled off around me. And it was very sweet because he was the senior member of that group. And so a little deference for the senior member. He knows this might be his last heist. You see it in his face. It just told this really incredible story. As it was happening, we all knew that was perfect. shot that the last day in Vegas. So it was great, sort of emotionally, I think, for everybody, you know, crew included, to sort of watch them all kind of say goodbye to each other. I thought it was just a heist movie. And by the time we shot that, everyone was such good friends that I think people were genuinely sad to just be leaving each other. That was feeding the scene. It makes it something deeper. Ocean's Eleven. It doesn't have this big budget feel to it. You felt like you were being told a story in an interesting way. Yes, it's a popcorn movie, it's a Hollywood movie, but it's made by Steven Soderbergh, which means there's gonna be a, a humanity. You can't help but make a movie like that. I had all high hopes for Ocean's Eleven, but until the Friday night it opened, I had no idea what it would do financially. This movie was a smash hit. I mean, huge, huge hit. Tess, I told you, I knew what I was doing. I love seeing a movie that just sort of does what it does and does it well and makes no argument about it, that you just surrender to it. You're either in or you're out, right now. For Ocean's Eleven, you wanted to go up and connect, and I think everybody did. It's just hard not to be happy about that.